Good morning. Good to see everybody today. We got some uh, folks back. Good to have you back again. And we uh, are glad to be here this morning. You've turned to number 683. Uh, let him have his way with you. We'll sing the first and last verse of this song, and then we'll be dismissed to our classes. Let me do my best here this morning. Y'all help me out. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with Him within the narrow road? Would you have Him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let Him have His way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. Numbers 
for that, as you can see there. And so all these different occasions we see this happening in our song books, we're going to find the same with the Psalms. For example, I stated this uh, three weeks ago. You remember John Fawcett wrote, Bless Me the Tide. And that's a very, very you know, common song to be, to be you know, in, in the church. Most people in the church know that song, Bless Me the Tide. But it's interesting, we don't sing it for the same purpose that he wrote it for, the reasoning behind it. He wrote the song to convey his sentiments and those of his wife with the poor people that were among them who they had chosen to live with. And so that's what that song was all about today. As we stated three weeks ago, where do we hear this a lot, this song? We hear it at weddings. We hear it at weddings. And what's another place we usually hear, especially in churches or, or gospel meetings or so and so? That's the final song. The final song. That's right. At, at the end. And, and we see that. And so we see these departure events take place at the weddings. And, you know, wherever we go, we are bound in the body of love of Christ. What's interesting, though, it was not written for that purpose at all. But it sounds like it does. I mean, it makes perfect sense when you read what is there. In a similar way, the editors of Psalms, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, you songs and psalms that have been composed by for various occasions, you would say, and use them in a new and special way in these writings, such is the case with these 15 songs of ascent. We understand as you look at them, you know, some are written way, I mean, hundreds of years apart from each other. And we see that, but the editor put those together for that purpose that we can see how important these were, that these are actually some prophecies taking place, things that were going to happen to Israel, or just some other ideas. We don't know 100%, but we can have an idea of what is going on there. So as we look at this, we go back to the history of Levitical time, of the, of the priests. There was a little Levitical group, we know that some think that this is what they did, that they would sing these psalms. As they walked up to the temple, because the temple was how many steps? Can you guess? 15 songs. How many steps do you think there are? 15. 15. And this is just a thought with some of the thank of. Uh, you know, it's not, it, it's a popular thought, popular belief, but it's just, for sure we don't know that. See, the Hebrew word for a sense, and this is what's interesting, where you think maybe it is that, is actually means steps. That's what the word actually means, the, the literal meaning to it, of a staircase. And so you look at that, but it's also, what's interesting, when you look at that, it gives it that, and it also talks about the degrees that are found on a sundial. And so you have these meanings that are there, and it makes a lot of sense of what's happening here. So, but when we look at this, let me give you the idea of what most people think. Most think that they were sown for one or two reasons, or perhaps three occasions, taking place in the time of Israel, in, their, you know, in, in, the, in the Hebrew nation of what was going on. And here's the first possibility. The first possibility was when the Jewish people would gather from their homes and travel as pilgrims to the, uh, you know, to the three Jewish festivals each year, singing one of these songs at each place along the way. This is where a lot of people look at this thing and think, maybe that's it, what it can be. As we look at this, you can imagine, imagine starting, and this is what I think is really interesting when you look at these. You start in verse, in chapter, in chapter 120, we're not going to read them all, but I'm just going to point out to you. Why this is usually the thought that this is about. In Psalm 120, that we are, here we see the singers that they're far from Jerusalem. They're way away from Jerusalem, possibly captivity. And in such places as Meshek, which is far north, and Kedar, which is southeast, they could have in those places too. So that's what we see in Psalm 120. Then in Psalm 121, we see them traveling up and down the hills. It talks about them traveling up and down these hills. Then in Psalm 122, it talks about anticipating actually standing in Jerusalem, being there one day soon. Psalm 124, getting past both robbers and storms along the way. Remember, the roads that went up to Jerusalem, were they kind and nice roads or were they very dangerous? They were very dangerous. We, we see an example of, you know, robbers, as we see this happening, that they would hide in trees, hide in areas, bushes, and so on, and would just would rob people. And it's crazy to think that that was the case, but they had, you know, they knew a lot of people were going to be coming during festival times, whatever they can, just take care of who they wanted. So that's what we see in Psalm 124. Then in Psalm 130, and these various tribes close, close basically, in on Jerusalem, that the sense of unity among the brethren. They talked about getting closer and closer, and then the unity that would take place with the brethren there. And then finally, being in the house of the Lord is chapter 134. It talks about being in the house of the Lord, perhaps arriving in the evening, enjoying the praise of the Lord for those who are ministering uh, there at that time. So when you look at it that way, we're like, okay, maybe that makes sense. Maybe this is why the 15 were written, because you see people traveling on their way to get there and different things taking place uh, throughout it. I want to note this, though. Whatever direction or elevation you are coming from, 
When you're going to Israel, you are always doing what? Going up. Always ascending. No matter what direction you come from, you are going up. And, uh, you know, as we see here, when you're heading to Mount Zion or to Jerusalem, and there's a couple things to do this. It is not that Israel or Jerusalem is basically higher in elevation than other places. That's not what it's all about. But that in Jerusalem, you were thought to be at the highest level with God, closest to Him. And yes, but you are traveling up. You're traveling up there, there, it's higher. But that was the main understanding. And it's kind of like that, that spiritual movement, you know, moving in the direction where you need to in this world today. And we're moving towards God closer and closer as we live this life. So that's the first uh, possibility of why these 15 chapters were written or put together and stayed out of the way they are. Number two, let's look at number two. What are the events of the Psalms? Uh, second possibility was when the Jews were returning from exile in Babylon, returning to Jerusalem after an absence of some 60 to 70 years. This really fits well in chapter 126. If someone would like to read that for us, Psalm 126, verses 1 and 2, and we'll see what it says. 126, Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. When the Lord turned again to captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with the laughter, and our tongue was, was seen. Then, then said that among the heathen, the Lord had done great things for them. Thank you. So the idea here, what we see of returning from exile in Babylon, would be why this collection was possibly placed here. Once again, another thought of Book 5, which is celebrating the Lord's triumph over Israel's enemies and looking what we know forward to the restoration at the ending of what they had basically gone through, everything that happened there. All this time when they were in captivity. In fact, the words ascent in each title, it's interesting. That's a little extra. You can go to this. The ascent in each title is a Hebrew word we know, uh, aliyah. And when you see this, it's used, Ezra used this word, talking about going up to Jerusalem. When he wrote in Ezra chapter 7, verse 9, when he said he began to go up from Babylon. And so we say, okay, maybe that's what this is about taking place here. And as he makes his way there, Aliyah, we know in modern Hebrew, can also mean immigration to Israel. And so that's what we see them doing. So there's a lot of different thoughts here with this. But one and two are, are really important to look at them, which uh, basically, as we look at this, I think brings us to the third possibility, which probably helps us more than anything. And this one talks about, has it been su suggested, that these songs were commissioned by Nehemiah at about 445 B.C., for the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles by the exiles who had returned from Babylon there to Jerusalem. This suggestion, I think, is probably a good answer because what it does is actually combines the idea of the previous two suggestions, puts them together. And so the third one makes a whole lot more sense when you look at it basically taking it as a whole, getting the, the whole picture. You know, the, the troubles described in some of these psalms, we understand as we look through them, fit well with what we read about in Nehemiah from neighboring nations who were opposed to the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the walls. You know, they didn't want them doing that. They said, you know, they're gone. We don't want them to be strong again and, and be courageous in any way whatsoever. And we know a lot of the enemies wanted that not to happen. But as we look at this with this 15 Psalms, we understand that our reading and singing of these Psalms may be enhanced by our understanding of the original design for their writing and their use that we see in 120 through 134. Right? think about this. We can picture ourselves as pilgrims on our way to Jerusalem for a festival. I mean, just think about that. If you were living way away or you were in exile coming back, you can just imagine the, the, how long it took to get there. But the anticipation, you know, how many here go on vacation from time to time? All right, I better see every hand here because I know everybody's gone on vacation here, right? All right, so, you know, when you're getting, you know, you know where you want to go, you can't wait to get there. As you're driving, you're getting closer and closer, you start anticipating that you're, you're going to be there, how much fun it is, and how great, and, and just being worse of that. You know, you may have the same thing, you know, when you were younger, you know, driving with mom and dad, you know, or, or whatever, if you had maybe family somewhere else, you know, outside of your town that you lived in, you know, the anticipation of seeing them that you haven't seen in a long time. So we see this. Also, number two, we can imagine ourselves as exiles returning to Jerusalem from Babylon, and or we can also see ourselves as joining with Nehemiah in Jerusalem at the Feast of the Tabernacles. So, all of these areas here, what we see here, what were the, the oh, excuse me, what event were the songs, these songs designed for? From my understanding, what I read and what I think, what I see here, well, remember what happened, has already happened in the the fifth book, and a little bit in the fourth, is, is people coming out of exile. It makes perfect sense. 
and when you put all these all these verses together, that they're in exile, and it's a lot of dealing with the same thing with Nehemiah. So that last really suggestion makes more sense than any. So I know it's a lot real quick. Just blew it out of there. Now, anybody else? Anybody coming? Any questions or comments before we run to number two? Remember, this is just an introduction to this to this uh, get, do this whole book. All right. So number two. Here's the second one. Why were these individual psalms put together as a collection? You know, what is the reason behind this? Once again, as with other suggestions, it is not the date or the or you know of the origin of the psalm. You know, that's the problem. That's the mistake people will make when they read the psalms. They're trying to figure out when it was written. That, that, that doesn't really matter when it was written. It's rather way how the editor fits the psalm, as we were saying, to the overall purpose of the entire collection. We're talking about the entire psalm, all of them. And we also see in each book the way it was there. So it's kind of like the skill of a, I guess you say, a stonemason. Think about a stonemason. Stone, uh, when he's building uh, something and he's doing, putting rocks and everything, you know, they don't always use brand new material. You know, they have a building that they tore down the rocks or they find rocks somewhere else on the land that they're building. You know, they'll use those too. They'll put them together. And we see that. And it's to build a beautiful new wall or structure that will be. And when it's completed, even with the old stuff there, you still consider it what? New. You do. And that's how we see this in the Psalms. In this, in this section of 15 Psalms, it has taken some of them from other chapters and put into here. And we talk about the purpose behind it and the reasoning because it reminds people of the time, not time, but it reminds people of the, the reasoning of set there so they know when they're coming back from certain things like the exile. Um, in Psalm 120, let's look at this. Psalm 120, the psalmist lives far from Jerusalem like the exiles in Babylon. Everyone turn over there. Let's look at Psalm 120. Now, like I said, I'm not going to read all. I'm not going to read all these 120 through 134. But let's go and read 120 and see how, how you can hear the sentence of them coming out of Babylon. Someone read that for us, please. Psalm 120. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and He heard me. Deliver my soul, Lord, from lying lips and from the deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Woe is me, then, that I sojourn in uh, the camp, and uh, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are far, they are for far for war. I'm it out. That's right, good. Thanks, we said. So as we see these here, we, we can understand that this, this comforting moment here, you know, as they're as they're moving and traveling there in, in 121, I mean 120 that we see that, that exile out of Babylon. Because you had the Jews, anybody that wasn't a Jew at this time was considered an enemy of God. Remember that anybody, that, that all the Gentiles, now there were some Gentiles, of course, who became proselytes. We talked about that. And we know that they went and talked to them and so on, and they actually started looking the Jewish way. But, uh, but that's what he says at the end there, where he says, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And that's exactly right. And this is where it breaks people to believe that this is about Babylon, of them, you know, the exiles from there. After we see all the exile taking place, which brings us Psalm 121. Psalm 121 refers to the hills which travelers, be they pilgrims traveling to the feast or exile returning home, would encounter along the way. And this is what we stated a moment ago when each one of these verses just seemed to, chapters just seem to be put together to really, you know, each event that they're dealing with, what's going on as they're coming out of exile. Let's look at 121. We're going to go ahead and read that one too. It's only eight verses. So, if someone would like to read that for us, please. Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this forward, time forth, and even forevermore. Thank you. So here when we look at this and we hear the word hills, there's a couple things we're usually thought about uh, here in this moment. Uh, hills can be a comforting picture of God's protection. And talk about Jerusalem, you know, set on a hill as we see there. But it also, when people talk about hills, 
they would immediately think about symbols of robbers because that's usually where the robbers were. They were in the hill area. You know, you're you're walking up. When, when do you think you're when, if you're hiking? Is it better going up or going down? Probably going down. Why? Why would we say down? It's easier. It's easier. It's exactly right. Our, our gravity body's kind of taking us in that way. Where we know going up, it's like, oh, come on. And then you feel like you never get there. So that would be an error of that. Or we also see there was something else very important with the hills called, remember, the high places that were set up, we see for pagan shrines and, you know, in their beliefs and worships when we get to that. Bill, go ahead. The Golan Heights have remained a source of conflict with Israel now. I mean, I know this is now, not then, but it's because it was a high ground, right? The high ground, and they didn't want the uh, Arabs to have a high ground where they could fire down on them. So even though it's nothing but rocky, nothing, and you can't really live there, the Golan Heights from the 1967-68 war, um, Israel took it. I mean, right. they, they took it. They said, we're not going to let you live up here. So yep. hills created a source of protection, of defense, and they served, sure didn't want the enemies overlooking them. That's exactly right. Any, any person that's ever you know, watched movies or read books or been in the military, you know that the high ground is always the place to be for everything. It's, all, it's always where it's at. And because you have to climb to get up and you're perfectly taking it. You know, it's nothing to get rid of everybody that's down there as they're moving their way up. And that's exactly right. That's where we see this my thought is with here with 121, uh, as uh, 121 as we're looking here at these, that these hills, <coughs> said, I looked up my eyes to the hills, that they're realizing they're like, that's where we want to be. That's Because that's where God protects you, up there. And so we see that. So um, that would be normal for everybody. So that's what we see with 121. 122 uh, goes a little bit more into this. We understand that it rejoices in the prospect of meeting together with others in the house of the Lord. You know, that, we do the same thing today, don't we? I mean, you know, we're excited to be here on Sunday, to be with the brethren, and be able to, you know, be together for this moment. Or say we have gospel meetings, you know, you're there, whatever it may be, we see that this can take place. In fact, Psalm 122, let's go ahead and read it also. Um, Psalm 122, a song of ascents. This one is a little different. They don't want to say song of ascents on it. This one actually gives you a little more information. The song of ascents of David. So David wrote the song that we would read. And this, remember, this is way earlier than the exile. So we said this is where they're taking of the old and bringing with the new to see what is found to kind of lead the people in the right direction. So if someone read 122 for us, please. Psalm 122. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment and thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. And for my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be unto thee, within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Thank you. So we can see, you know, David writing this because this is talking about as if the temple and the walls are there, right? That, that everything's there. We've seen exactly what it was during David's time. Not the temple yet, but we know the tabernacle is what we find. Um, of course, the temple would come later with Solomon. But he's talking about these things knowing that this was going to be built. Because God has already told them that his son was going to build it and that David would collect everything for it. And, but we look at this and we go, why would it be placed all the way over here? Because it's to remind the people of what was done with Jerusalem. Remember, David could talk about it like it was already there. But it wasn't. Think about the Israelites now coming back out of exile. They could talk about it like it's there, but it's not yet. They're going to have to rebuild. And we see this is what David is showing them, where that protection, where the, you know, the prospect of meeting together, coming together in the house of the Lord and what it would do for everybody that's there. So that's what we see with that, that third point. The fourth point, why were these individual psalms put together as a collection? Psalm 127 gives us the answer. It is a psalm of Solomon, and it is at the center of the 15 psalms, and it's on purpose why it's here like this. Let's go ahead and look at Psalm 127, and I think I have one. Let me see. Psalm 127. Let's go ahead and read it, please. Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman walketh, uh, waketh, uh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, 
for uh, so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, so are the children of youth. Happy is the man that hath the swimmer full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Thank you. Now, when you look at these psalms, you go back and look at these. You start at 120, and something you notice about each one of them, it, not in word of sense. Anything else anybody notices something about these that is not the same in most of the psalms? They're very what? What do you think? Short. They're very short. That's exactly right. They're very short psalms. And there's a reason behind it we see they were included in this collection to be short because they're suitable for reciting on a journey. And that's what we find with them. They're very simple to remember. And so they are suitable both for David's day and the return to Jerusalem in later generations. For example, Psalm 122, we mentioned both David and the returning exiles would have been thrilled with approaching the holy city, the Lord's temple. David, knowing that it's not there yet, but he was excited still to be at Jerusalem, be there where the synagogue was, I mean synagogue, tabernacle was, and uh, uh, what we find with it. We should also appreciate the fact that with these 15 psalms, the way they're arranged, the whole group, the entire group, is arranged around Psalm 127. They're all around it. On both sides stands a grouping of seven pilgrim psalms, each consisting, it's interesting, of two psalms of David. Five new ones attributed to no one. So we have two old ones on each side, and then five new ones. He said that, that no one's attributed to no one at all. And each group of seven contains the name of the Lord. This one's interesting. Yahweh, 24 times. I mean, when you think about this, the arrangement cannot be what? Can't be accidental. There's, there's no way this could be done by accident. The placement of Psalm 127 at the very center of the collection is meant to draw our attention to what is happening in these songs and the way they're put together. Bill? They're beautiful, poetic, and uplifting. They mostly just beautiful, poetic, uplifting, everything good. That's exactly right. The only we see one that's about curses, but it's but it's curses on people that aren't looking to God. And but they are, they're all just wonderful. You know, these are songs that, that you sing with joy, you know, joy, happiness, and you know, we see that, and that would be that time, you know, you're leaving where, where you know, where you where you're basically born in exile, you were a child coming into there, you're actually getting to leave now, leave that place and go back to your home that they haven't seen, or never seen a lot of them, never have seen at all. But they've been gone 60, 70 years, we see this happening. So talking about the Lord's house and children being a heritage to the Lord, that's what that is about the end of that, as we see. Go back to Psalm 127, where it says, Happy is the man who has a square full of them, they shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gates. This, as we would say, this is, as we said, talking about the Lord's house and children being a heritage of the Lord. It's, it's important to realize that, what our children are about and how God looks at us and how he says we should look at our own children. So that's the number two that we look at there, the reason as we would find the inclusion of why these are put together this way, which brings us to number three, the third thought we have here. Why did this collection get put here in book five? You know, why was the placement actually put here at this point. The basic answer is because we understand that they speak the wonderful truth that God's people are coming home to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion, and even better, to their Lord, to the Lord, their eternal dwelling place. See, this is what they get to experience. This is what they get to see and realize. And uh, we need to be a part of that and understand how important that really is as we get through these. So that's that's it basically. That one. That's all that's all the that uh, number the reason for the placement was just so that they could remember these things. And you know, when we go back, it's hopefully now, if you read the Psalms, if, you know, if you ever, you, when you're reading these Psalms here in this section, you can think about them coming out of exile. It makes it more understandable. And it makes it more, you know, enjoying because we're like, wow, that, I, I want to feel like that. I want to feel excited to be with people, you know, at, at worship. I want to be excited to be with the church and, and do those things. And, and that's what we see this about here. So any comments, questions before we move into 135 through 50? Anybody else? Anybody got anything at all? All right. That was pretty quick. Oh, go ahead. The, the thought is, too, these people had been, as you said, in exile, and now they're free. Right. And that brings joy. Our march to Zion, we were once captive to sin, <laughs> and now we're free. And we sing with gladness and joy, looking towards 
and looking up towards our Jerusalem, exactly. eternal life. That's exactly right. You know, when we look to God, we usually, exactly right there, where do we always look to? We look up, don't we? We look at now we bow our heads. That's out of that's out of respect and kindness when we're praying and so on. But when we look up, we're like, because he says, you know, it's the heavens, you know, the earth. And I remember the Jews, when they said the word heavens, they talk about three places. You know, the sky, space, and then where God resided. And so we have that. So that's what we do, and that's exactly right. That as we go through this life, you know, we need to be looking up with anticipation. And remember, these folks were on a journey to come back home. We are on a journey until we leave this world. We're going to a home we've never seen. That's exactly that's right. That's right. So some of those, yeah, a lot of them had never seen it. They've been told about it, as we understand, they were born in exile. And we see it's taking place. And, you know, that's the, that's the great thing about these psalms when you look at this, is uh, the blessings. Like Bill said, you know, they're very joyful psalms. They are. They're very, you know, they're exciting psalms of, of what we've seen and understand. So that's what we find here with these, these readings of this uh, chapter, these 15 psalms. We'll come back to some of these. I will actually uh, have, have classes on one chapter here and there of this, from this just introduction to all of them that take place. Which brings us to this next point. Uh, David's final psalms and the grand finale praise, as we see taking place in Psalm 135 uh, through Psalm 150. So if everyone turns over there, turn over to 135, and uh, you're going to notice that these are longer psalms. They're not more reciting uh, like we saw these other ones. So they're, they're long psalms to think about. So as we look to these, we will realize that there are three transitional psalms of historical recollection of, of what's happening here in uh, chapter 135 through 137. Uh, Psalm 135, I don't think I have it there to do it. Yep, Psalm 135 begins and ends with praise the Lord. The only psalm that stands alone outside a grouping of this type of psalm. In fact, everyone look over there. 130, uh, let me see, 135. Let me get over there real quick. Look at the very beginning of 135. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O you servants of lords. And then at the end, we see the same thing in a blessing. It says, Blessed be the Lord out of Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. So this is a very important psalm, this chapter, because it's all about praising Him and the importance that comes along with it. In fact, when we see this uh, Psalm 135, as we know, once again, it doesn't have any title whatsoever. No title with it at all. It doesn't say who it's from or anything as we see here. But we look at this and we go, what would be the reasoning behind this praise and praise? The reason for this is 135 borrows from two psalms. It goes all the way back to 113 and 115. It borrows from these two psalms, which surrounded the center psalm of the Praise the Lord collection. And then at the middle of 135, it actually talks about and reminds us of the events of the Exodus from Egypt, which we saw in 114. So 135 is, once again, a historical marker to see, okay, this is what they went through, this is what we're going through. And the psalmists are basically wanting to realize, look, God is always there. God's always there. He will never leave you. You can leave Him, but He will not do that. Remember, as we see, we see that 400-year period, uh, you know, intertestamental period, from the Old Testament to that when we see John the Baptizer come in on the scene. You have all that period there where there were no what at all? No revelation. No revelation, no prophecies, nothing from God. And we go, well, there you go right there. God left him. You think God left? God is everywhere. He was always there. What was he waiting on? What were the Israelites not doing? They were being obedient. They were worshiping. They were doing the things they needed to be doing. So it wasn't like uh, God was there. It's just they weren't calling upon him. And, and that's what we see. So 135 is a reminder of that to basically don't get caught up in that ever again. Don't make yourself there. Well, even though these songs were written like this, don't get caught up in this ever again. What does Israel end up doing? They do it anyways. I mean, they just, they just go back to it again. And even as a far as we can go further, you know, there's chapters here in Psalms where it talks about, you know, sacrificing of their children. They've gone that far. And it's, it's really just so difficult to read those words and, and to think about how somebody can do that when they have God on their side. And they know what he's done for them. And, um, you know, the same thing happens today with Christianity. Someone will find Christ. They'll, they'll look to him, baptize for mission of sins, and then fall away and never look back. I mean, and it's so sad to see those things happen. Dad, go ahead. He goes back all the way to Joshua. Yep. Now they followed, and then when Joshua died, and the elders there began to teach, or not teach, and there arose a generation that knew not God. 
it, it perpetuates in almost every generation that that happens. It is today. Exactly. What's scary about that moment there with Joshua and then that generation, that it moved so quick. You know, they got there so fast. You know, not to, not, to, not knowing God at all anymore. And uh, you, you think that, uh, you know, what, what is the deal there with that? And we need to think the same thing as us with Christianity. You know, if we fall away from God, we need to do everything to get back. And realize, and we do that by looking at those other psalms we read just a moment ago and look to. We pray to Psalm 136. Uh, Psalm 136. Everyone look at there. Look there with me. Okay, this ain't going to work. There we go. Psalm 136. Um, 136 is arranged to sing alternately uh, in two groups, basically, back and forth. Uh, we see, and this is nothing new for us today. In fact, just to give you a little understanding of this chapter here, uh, 26 times we hear the refrain. And the refrain basically is a regular, you know, reoccurring phrase or verse, especially at the end of a stanza or a division or a poem or a song. So we see that 26 times within this chapter. And that what we see is give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his mercy or love endures forever. And we find that happening. In fact, the psalm proceeds as we understand. Let me get over it. Come on, thanks for working. All right, the psalm proceeds from creation of verse 5 through 9. Everyone look at that, Psalm 136. And I want us to look at verses 5 through 9. I'll read this real quick. It's almost out of time. It says, To him by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid up the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. You see the, the refrain going back and forth there. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. We see this going back and forth. To redemption. I'm not going to read it all. 10 through 24 it talks about the redemption that's found in God, which will later be found in Christ. And then finally to the province, Luke verse 25. And it says these words, verse 25, who gives food to all flesh for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven for his mercy endures forever. So as we see this and think about it, each new remembrance of God's faithfulness calls for another singing response of thanks be to the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's what it's showing here. Each time as we would see this coming about, both groups as they repeat each other during while they're singing, which we do basically today. We do the same thing when we sing four-part harmony and, you know, in our worship service with certain songs. We know a lot of times the, the men will sing a section or we sing the bass and song, you know, and then you have, the, you have a higher pitch note sung by the women usually. Not all women. Some men do that too or vice versa as we see that, but, but that's what we see and we repeat those things. And it sounds good, doesn't it? Do everyone agree with that? It usually, it usually. It sounds really good. And, and we see that happening as we go forth with it and how great that is. They did the same thing in the Psalms. And it was done there to remind people, to remind them how important God was and how important He is today. So that's what we see there. So the last one we saw, 137. I'm not going to read it right now. It's the right time. Um, 137 is about the exiles in Babylon and a curse song, as we discussed earlier. They're going to uh, basically the cursing that came upon those who were followers of God or who were against God and His ways. So that's what we got. That, that'll be it. We'll go ahead and get this next week. Any comments or questions before we close? None? All right. I appreciate all the comments and uh, questions as we were going through class. Thanks.